Hi guys, in this video, I'm going to talk about the different activation functions or units that are commonly used in neural networks. And I hope to give more intuition about them. So let's start with what I call the classical activations. So the sigmoid, also known as the logistic function, which is given by this function over here, the tan h uh, function, which uh, is basically also equal to this, and the rectified linear unit, also known as ReLU, uh, which is basically taking the maximum between x and 0. So the ReLU is the new kid on the block. It's only been in use really in the past 12, 13 years or so. Yeah, but it's already enough time for it to be considered classical uh, in the field of machine learning. So this is how the functions look. In blue, you have the actual activation function, and in orange, you have the derivative of them. So for the sigmoid, we see it's a function that starts at 0 and goes all the way to 1, and it's equal to uh, 0 0.5 at 0. For tan h, we see that it's a function that is bounded between minus 1 and 1, very similar to the sigmoid, only it's between minus 1 and 1, and so the uh, derivative is also a bit bigger. The ReLU is a bit different. It's basically the identity function for uh, x above 0, and it's 0 for x below 0. And you can see that the derivative is basically 1 for x above 0 and 0 for everything else. And this is how the functions look like uh, compared to each other. So in blue, you have the sigmoid. In orange, you have the tan h. And in green, you have the ReLU. And this is how their derivative look like. So again, in blue, you have the derivative of the sigmoid. In orange, you have the derivative of the tan h. And in green, you have the derivative of ReLU. So now let's look at some problems that uh, each of these activation functions have. And I encourage you to go over this again once you've watched the back propagation videos in this series. So what are the problems of the sigmoid and tan h? Well, the first problem is called the vanishing gradients. So gradients are relatively small. If you look at the sigmoid and tan h, so the blue and the orange curves over here, yeah, this is 1 and this is 0. OK, so most of the values of the derivatives is less than 1 and often much less than 1, very close to 0. So in neural networks, when we use deep networks, the gradients are being multiplied by each other. And so the gradients of the previous layers of their activation is multiplied by the gradients of the previous layer of the previous layer of the previous layer. And so when you multiply all these numbers, which are all smaller than 1, are very close to 0, uh, the gradients become smaller and smaller in absolute size, and they basically start to vanish. You basically get something that is close to zero. And if your gradient is zero, then you can't really do gradient descent. And so the weights are stuck in place and your network doesn't learn. Okay, so consider that we have these different layers and eventually we have this final output and we calculate the loss and then we take the derivative uh, backward and backward and backward. Then every time we move from here to here, we take the derivative of the activation function. And it will be an element-wise operation. For the sigmoid and the tan h, these derivatives can be really small. And then they accumulate as we go backward in the network. Yeah? So the network is this one for the forward propagation. And this one is for the back propagation. So as we go backward, uh, you take the product of many small numbers. And eventually, you might get a very small number or even 0 because the computer can't handle such small numbers. OK, so this was the vanishing gradient problem. Another problem or a con of these two activation functions is that they use the exponent operation. And this is more computationally expensive than the ReLU, who just uses a max, which is less computationally expensive. A third problem of the sigmoid and tan h is called saturations. So if the inputs to the neuron are very big, positive or negative, then the derivative of these functions are very small. And as such, the learning becomes very slow. So we have a neuron and we have inputs to it. And if these inputs are very big, it could be that it's plus 10 or minus 10. And they are very big in absolute size. Well, all these functions, it means that we are putting the function somewhere here when it comes to the derivative. Yeah. So 
it will be here for the actual function value. And here it's the value of the derivative. These values of the derivative will be very small. And again, we will have a problem where the learning becomes very, very slow. So this is a problem for each layer at itself. Yeah. So we have some weights going to this neuron. If the Z value here, the input to the neuron is too big, then the derivative just with regards to these weights will be too small because the final gradient of A with regards to Z uh, will be very small. So the final gradient of the loss with regards to W will be small and it won't move so much. So this is called saturations and it's a problem that sigmoid and tan H functions have. And so they, they are sometimes also called saturated functions. Okay, these are the problems that are common for both sigmoid and tan H. ReLU has its own problem. It's called dying ReLU. So consider a case where the inputs to a ReLU neuron is negative for all the data samples. Basically, for the whole data, the inputs to some neuron are all negative. And this can happen, for example, if you initialize the weights to be too big when you just initialize the neural network or when you use a too big uh, learning step. So these things can happen. And so in that case, that neuron is basically dead. It's completely turned off. It's not useful. It's not used in any way in the learning. Why is that? Well, because all of the inputs to that neuron on all of the data sets will be negative, then after the ReLU, it will always output zero. And so the weights of the next layer, they cannot move because their gradients will be zero. Why is that? Well, because the derivative of the loss with regards to them is just equal to the derivative of the loss with regards uh, to the inputs to the next layer. Yeah, yeah. so here we will have some z l plus one, which is equal to the previous activations times w l plus one plus the bias term. Uh, this times the derivative of z l plus one with regards to w l plus one, which are just equal to the a l themselves. But we just said that the a l, the activations are zero, so this is equal to zero. So this can't move, this is stuck, the gradient is zero, so it will stay the same. But this can't move either, because for the same reasons, once we calculate the gradient using the backprop algorithm, these terms over here, the gradients of the activations with regards to their input, but we just said that the gradient of ReLU is equal to zero uh, when the inputs are negative. So this thing is also zero, and so the whole thing is zero. And so this thing can't learn either. So all the weights that are going into that neuron and all the weights that are going out of that neuron are stuck. And that neuron is basically dead. And the outputs of that neuron is always zero. Yeah, so this is the dying ReLU problem. And we will see that there are ways to overcome this in a second. Another problem that is common for both sigmoid and ReLU is called the bias shift. So the problem here is for sigmoid and ReLU, all the outputs are above or equal to zero. And this causes inefficient learning. Now, this can also occur in other activation functions if the mean of the activation is far from zero. So it, there are some activation functions where it's not that all of the outputs are greater or equal to zero, but most of them are. So in that case, we also have a problem. It's less severe than the sigmoid and ReLU case, but let's see what's the problem. So for each neuron, there's a weight vector associated with that single neuron, right? So let's say that this is the previous layer. These are the activations from the previous layer. They go in using the uh, linear layer and they go into this neuron, yeah? So we get a Z here and the Z is equal to some A, W plus B. And, and then we pass it through the activation function. Okay, so what is the gradients uh, with regards to that vector, it will just be it will just be this a times the gradient before. So we will take the derivative of the loss with regards to uh, these inputs times the derivative of uh, this input with regards to these weights. But this will be just the activations here. And now we know that all the activations are above zero. And this derivative over here, this is a scalar. So everything up to here will also be a scalar. We don't know exactly what it will be, but we know that it's either a positive or a negative. So this vector of W that has three elements here can either go in a direction where all the three elements are positive or all the three elements are negative. 
I will draw it here in two dimension. Yeah, so suppose we only have, I don't know, W1 and W2, okay? So this vector can only go either in this direction over here, yeah? Is this all the span of this direction if uh, both A1 and A2, let's say, are positive, or it can go in this direction, okay? In this uh, spectrum of direction. And this very limits the the way that this vector can move in space. Basically, it kind of walks in a zigzag or in a diagonal. This is in 2D, but this generalized to three or higher dimensions. And all in all, what happens is that um, the learning becomes inefficient and more slow. So this is the problem that we have with the sigmoid and the relu. And it's mostly because the outputs are always positive. To some extent, it also happens when um, the output's mean is far from zero. Okay, so these were the problems of the three classical activations. Let's talk a second about the output activations. So depending on the problem, if we have a regression problem, we usually won't use an activation function or we will just use the linear or the identity activation function. If we have a binary classification problem, the most popular activation function is the sigmoid. Um, here, the output is understood to be the probability of being in a certain class. If we have a multi-class classification problem, we will use a, an activation called the softmax, which I discussed in another video. We first make all the outputs positive by taking the exponent of them, and then we normalize them such that they sum up to one. This is the softmax function, and this is understood as basically the probability of being in a certain class.